Hello, screenwriters, and welcome to Screenwriting Step-by-Step, Step, episode number 18. Uh, I am Glenn Gers. This is Writing for Screens YouTube channel, live streams. Uh, we are doing every Monday through Friday, if I can, at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, you can ask me almost anything if you are here live. Or uh, if you are not here live, you can still ask me things. Just go to writingforscreens.com. Contact Me is on almost every page, and it's got its own page by itself. So you can send me a question through that. And you can also ask me a question by simply typing it into the comments. Just comment and ask me a question. In fact, today we've got a couple of those that I will be answering from people who were not live. They were alive when they wrote these questions, but they are not currently live. Um, so I'm going to answer them now. They will watch at their leisure through the magic of YouTube. So let's see what's going on first with our Notes. I have got some notes here. I just a little bit I worked on. Um, uh, it occurred to me that uh, just came to me, came to me in a flash uh, about what's the thing that George has has figured out that triggers this entire story. Um, because somewhere before the episode starts, before the show starts, George has come upon a clue that helps him to crack the cold case of the poisoning serial killer. And uh, I was thinking about that moment when they go, holy crap, he actually did it. Crazy George, the lunatic podcaster, he actually solved the case. And I was thinking, what, what was that? What what?" did solve it. And this is one of the worst things about writing. You actually have to figure out the genius things that you want your characters to be so smart about, which means you have to be smart. It is such a drag. Um, it's so much better if you want to write about like a great singer and then you could just say they write, they, they sing an amazing song and then it's somebody else's problem how to make that happen. Uh, but when you're writing a, a a story where people have to be smart and do smart things and say smart things, that's on you as the writer. That's your problem. So what I realized is it's DNA. Um, and the question is, is how did George get the DNA? And that's the cool thing that George did. That's where George was smart, is that he figured out some place that there would be DNA from this poisoner because the poisoner was careful. He was smart, like the Unabomber, um, who was very, very careful to make sure he knew how they investigated crimes. And so he reverse engineered himself to not fall into any of those traps. Our guy must have done that. And George will figure out some place or time when this person left a trace of DNA. He doesn't have it yet. He has no ability to do the DNA tracing. Um, but he's figured out the clue. Um, I have not yet figured out where this DNA is, but at least I know this. I know that it's going to be a DNA sample. So, you know, that's something. Uh, let us take this and put it into the outline because that's what we do. Um, let's figure out where we put it. When you get a good idea, put it into the outline. The outline is the, the working document that will become the script. It is the, the place where all your thoughts go to bounce off each other and, and demand more thinking. Uh, let's see, Madeline. Clue. Well, this is close to it. We'll put it here. George discovered a clue to the serial poisoner's identity. Uh, 
And now that note is here. This is what motivated Zach to try, yeah, Zach to actually kill George and take over the podcast so he could claim credit for the scoop. Scoop, it's not scop. Okay, nice. We have made progress made a little progress, and that is at the moment where we are going to take a little break because someone asked a question. Um, and uh, I have it here. Hang on. Meowch uh, wrote a very sweet uh keep doing what you're doing kind of message, and then asked a cool question, which was, just like how you have to choose a genre that will be dominant over the other, rom-com versus thriller, do you at some point have to choose a dominant main character too? Or is it possible for all main characters to equally own that main role? This is a terrific, useful question. Uh, I am so happy to be able to answer it. A um, couple of things about this. First of all, um, the part about, oh, just like you had to choose the serial killer over the rom-com. I do want to point out, I didn't have to. Um, it is possible to write uh, a genre-blended serial rom-com thing, uh, thriller, I didn't feel up to it in this project. I didn't feel it was going to be a good test of, uh, of my abilities. And, and so I chose in this case to prioritize one or the other. I just didn't want to make, didn't want to make it clear. You can, you can try to do a, in a 50, 50 thriller rom-com and you probably could pull it off. I didn't think I could pull it off while I was trying to teach screenwriting. Um, and so that's a, a, a minor point, but I just didn't want to, to never, Try, never give the impression to you guys that I'm saying, you know, you can't do it. This is the rule. It's an absolute never in the history of this society has anyone ever been able to do this. Even if that were true, even if no one has ever done a thing, it's worth trying to do if you really, really feel it. And if you want to work as hard as it will take to do something that no one has ever done, give it a shot. Um, I don't personally like when... Uh, art teachers teach some absolutes. Uh, there, are, there are almost no absolutes. I, I, I say even, even the things that I say, like think in scenes or stuff, maybe you don't have to. There's people who don't. You know, I'm not sure that Terrence Malick <laughs> uh, or David Lynch uh, thinks in scenes as much as I would like them to. Um, and damn, they make some great, great movies. Um, and so, you know, these are rules I'm putting forth as as tools, as skills, not as absolutes. They're just a thing to try and use. Okay, next, let's get into this question about, oops, wrong one, characters, which is, do you at some point have to choose a dominant main character? Um, and that's the cool question. And the answer is, no, you do not. Um, it is often taught you have to have a main character, one main character, and they have to be on this type of story, and it has to have these steps along the way. That's not true. It is true that if you want to tell that type of story, if you want to be in that tradition, if you want to follow that formula, you have to do that. But you don't, because there's so many good stories where uh, there's multiple main characters, lead characters, central characters. Um, by the way, I don't much like the word hero um, because it's just got too much baggage. Um, first of all, it suggests someone should be heroic um, and, and main characters often are not. And second of all, it goes with this, you know, uh, Joseph Campbell tradition, which is Joseph Campbell is a, a marvel, but he's not the 
be all and end all of all stories. And the fact that he said all mythology leads to this mega story, he didn't really say that the way that everyone's using it. And what's more, if you actually read his mythology books other than Hero with the Thousand Faces, he goes all over the place with all sorts of different types of mythology, and it's beautiful and cool, and I would highly recommend that. It's called, uh, let me see if I can, can I do this during the show? The Masks of God. Let me see, are, are you guys going to, well, I don't know what you're seeing when I'm doing this, but um, The Masks of God, look at that. Look at that, and I made it. I'm making it big. We're just we're just experimenting here. The Mass of God is a four book series by Joseph Campbell, which sums up his research into mythology, and uh, it's amazing reference work and just fascinating. And I would say if you're going to read Hero of a Thousand Faces, that's fine, uh, but Mass of God is better, um, much more thought provoking. I have gone off on a bit of a tangent. The uh, answer about main characters. Main characters, you can have as many as you can fit that you comfortably can follow as long as they each has a legitimate story. In other words, each one has a logical progression of their character and that their um, stories work together to form a single story. That's really the key, is that if you're trying to tell a single story, and it's possible to, to do a movie or show which actually tells multiple stories, but if you are telling one with one story, then the two or more characters have to tell one story. Um, especially in romantic comedies, that's pretty much required. If you think about something like Notting Hill, magnificent romantic comedy, or Roman Holiday, which I had mentioned, or just, just about any of them, what you're seeing is two main character stories. There's an actual name for it in theater and Hollywood. Uh, it's called a two-hander. And, um, and that's what you're doing. You're telling one story of a relationship between two people. So each one story relates to the other person's story and to the overall story. There is an overall story in, in uh, the overall story of um, Notting Hill is how these two people come together to give each other something that they both desperately need. One needs a, a, a taste of real life and real love, and the other one could use a little pizzazz in his life. And, and they, they each have what the other needs, and the question is how do they overcome the very large obstacles to getting there, um, internal and, obst and external obstacles. So that's a very clear two-hander. You wouldn't say that either one of those characters is the one. You could probably argue, and some, I'm sure, screenwriting teachers with a nice scolding mentality will say, it's Hugh Grant's story. But you know, it's not. It's just not. I'm, I'm calling it. It's not. It's the story of the two of them. The fact that it may start on one character or another, oh well, it could have started the other way. Um, it's about the two of them, I think. I don't think it's, you know... We can argue this. This is actually the one reason I don't like to talk about uh, existing work. Anyone can interpret it all sorts of different ways. It doesn't solve the problem of trying to write something. Because the problem of trying to write something is it doesn't exist yet. So you're making the decisions. You are making the choices. This is a big one. Everything is a choice and every choice has a price. And that is the truth of writing, that um, you can tell two stories. It means that you have to balance them. It means that you have to um, figure out a way to, um, to have them need each other or help each other or change each other. Um, there's, there's so many ways to do a two-hander. Almost every good love story is one. Um, there's a magnificent movie called Two for the Road with Audrey Hepburn and Albert Finney, which is an amazing time-shattered uh, love story romance. Anyway, um, hold on, we got a visitor. Hello, Troy David Films. Oh, hold on. There you go. Uh, 
I am uh, talking about whether or not you need one main character. Let's look at, while we're on Notting Hill, uh, Richard Curtis wrote that. He also wrote an amazing movie called Love Actually. Love Actually is many lead characters, uh, many main characters. Um, and the whole point is the, the balance of them together says love is a complex thing in which there are many, many varieties of love. The love of a sister for her brother, the love of a husband for his wife, the love of a, of a person who is uh, in love with someone who is marrying someone else. There are so many stories there. Um, and that's the point. The point is uh, love is all around. That's It's in the song. Um, I, I highly recommend Love Actually as a uh, an example of how many central characters you can juggle. It's brilliantly done. Um, and... Uh, so I would say that's a case of weaving together many, many stories that as a result, they're slightly shorter, but damn if they're not rich and powerful, even in their shortness. <laughs> um, I, Love actually is a, just wipes out any concept that you need one main character. Um, and one way it does it, he Richard Curtis wrote about how he wrote Love Actually, and what he said is, I wanted to make an Altman film, which is interesting. There's a guy named Robert Altman came a generation before Curtis. He uh, loved ensemble movies. He just took a whole bunch of the Nashville was his big breakthrough, in which he uh, followed a whole bunch of people in the city of Nashville over a brief period of time. It's a brilliant movie, uh, very different from Love Actually. Um, very loose and, and shambling and, and casual, um, whereas Love actually is precisely and brilliantly crafted. Both are good. Both are worth watching. Um, so that is just some stuff to think about. We are actually going to work on, we are working on here, a story of two main characters. Um, and the answer is, I have to figure out how it is the story of both of them, of of uh, Madeline and George. So let's do just a little bit of thinking about that because the question is, what is the unified story of Madeline and Norman? Sorry, Norman. Each has their own story. Um, and I've been trying to figure those out. And what I've got is Madeline needs to change and grow. Norman needs to let go of the past and his own ego. Um, so those are two separate things. The point is the unified story has to be, doesn't, <laughs> I don't, when I say has to be, I mean, I feel like it has to be. I don't mean like it has to be, um, has to be that each of them helps or provokes the other to do the thing they need. Okay, that is the unified, in other words, something about Madeline is going to, uh, and I think I know what it is already. Uh, Madeline is going to poke at, poke holes in Norman's ego. <laughs> that is Madeline's style. Like I, I just, I'm be, it's beginning to click. One of the things that, uh, that happens here is things just begin to click and you say, I know that character. Madeline pokes Norman. Madeline sees through Norman. She sees through him. Um, and Norman is going to believe in Madeline and encourage her, which is, by the way, I believe, which is new for Norman. Uh, he's not a big believer in other people. He's not. He's a critic of other people, um, and he's not a big you rah rah you go. But I think that what we're going to see here is that um, that Norman's admiration for her and love for her makes him behave in a new way. Um, so this is the unified story. The unified story is 
in these two people coming together, they give each other what they needed in their own stories. And that's how you do a story with more than one lead character. You find out how they affect each other. And if you think about also, I mean, just let's, let's do some quickies. Up. Up is a great story of, of this kid and this old man who, who give each other something that they each need. You can just, you just can go forever on stories where what you need is, is a combination of people. That's, that's where you get past the single hero's journey. Um, okay, I'm going to briefly copy this. Oh, sorry, you're not seeing what I'm doing. I'm going to briefly copy this into the overview because it's just too damn good and I don't want to forget it. So, um, oh, look at this. There's questions and here's answers. Damn, we are writing. This is, this is how you write, folks. You have questions. Sooner or later, you leave them there for a week or two. You keep working. You keep asking specific questions. You get answers. Um, and with that, I am going to stop that for a sec because we have um, a question. And the question is, I'm sorry, I changed my typeface, so it's hard to read here. Um, how do you write camera angles in a screenwriting format from Troy David? And um, the answer is mostly you don't try not to write camera angles in the script. And unless you're actually writing a, sh a shooting script that you are in production on and you want to communicate to the crew, but even then I would say go light on them, try not to write camera stuff in your script. Uh, if you are planning to direct it yourself, make those notes separately. But the idea of writing the script is you're trying to create an illusion of being in the moment, of being in the world of the characters. And therefore, you don't want to be pulling everyone out all the time to say, we zoom in slowly. Imply that we are getting a close-up by describing something closely. Imply that there's a cut by having a paragraph break. Um, I will try and show this as we go on here in screenwriting step by step. When we get to the actual writing, I'll try and show you. In fact, I will show you because it's how I write. Uh, so I will have no choice but to show you that you think in terms of visuals, but you don't describe them as if you are giving instructions to a crew um, because that screws up the read for the person who is trying to say to themselves, do I believe in this story enough to put money into it? Um, cool. Oh, wow. I love when things are good. Uh, th that makes sense. I'm new screenwriting and that helps a lot. Great. My work here is done, but it's not. It's not done because we have this other cool question. Um, and it is an ask me almost anything. It is not related to uh, the script we're writing. It's, uh, it came up about when I mentioned Roman Holiday. Be easy in the comments. And I just want to emphasize this again. You can ask me questions in the comments if you are writing, if you are watching this when I am not live. Don't wait till I'm actually not alive. When I am not live per day, uh, you can just ask me a question in the comments. I will try and grab as many as I can. Hopefully, if, if we keep getting bigger and bigger audiences, I may get overloaded. But for the moment, I'm trying to grab as many as I can and answer them. This one, the question comes down. Um, B. Izzy, frankly, didn't like the ending of Roman Holiday. I disagree, but I can understand it. Um, for one thing, it's very, very understated. For another thing, it is it is painful. Um, and uh, yet, I personally love it, but I, I get that you don't. And that really comes down to a question of uh, everyone who watches art has the right to their opinion. But you asked a question which is really good. Can you totally blow or kind of blow a script with the ending? Does it matter what the audience thinks is really a separate question, but I'm going to get into that too. Is the ending bad if almost everyone hates it? And it's reality, kids suck it up. These are good questions. There's a bunch of them there. I'm going to try and dip into all of them. Uh, can you mess up with the ending? Yeah, you sure can. 
Partly, I would say you, I mean, let's remember something. There is no such thing as good or bad art in an absolute sense. It is subjective. There is no objective, this is good, this is bad. If somebody likes chaotic things where stuff happens out of nowhere, then that would be good for them, even if in the, for everyone else it would be kind of confusing. Um, I mean, like the end of Monty Python and the Holy Grail in some ways really sucks, but it's also really satisfying in a comedy, change your reality kind of thought. Um, there is no such thing as this is good, this is bad. Just doesn't exist. Uh, it's a matter of opinion. Um, you can say, this is why I think it's good or bad. And if the person agrees with those values, they'll probably agree that it's good or bad. But um, a lot of times things are good or bad because that's how you feel. Um, but can you totally blow or kind of blow a script at the ending? Sure. Um, it, within the boundaries of most definitions or, or Hollywood's definitions, I would say one of the ways you can blow an ending is by literally having it come out of nowhere. If, if you've been going a certain way and all of a sudden at the end things get very, very different, it's kind of hard to keep the audience hanging on when you make that sharp turn out of, you know, and I, I hesitate to say always, but most of the time. You can also blow an ending by giving it away. By the, by the time you get there, it's a dray. It's like, yeah, I know, I saw this. Can we get over it? Uh, you can blow an ending um, by having char characters act very much out of character. Um, and a really good way to blow an ending is by having the ending not be something related to the character's actions. That if, if an ending comes from the famous criticism of the deus ex machina, which used to be the way Greek theater ended, um, <laughs> I will get to that for a second, Madeline. Um, uh, Deus ex machina was that a god would come down, literally on a kind of contraption called the machine, god from the machine, deus ex machina, and would just say like, okay, you get this fate and you get that fate and this is why it's good and this is why it's bad. And it, it advanced the concept of fate, <laughs> but was really bad for the concept of character. Um, anyway, so those are among the ways that you can have an ending totally suck, frankly. Um, so yes, the answer to can you totally blow an end script at the ending? Sure. But let's remember, it will be to a certain extent a matter of opinion. Um, and so therefore, the, on Roman holiday, I don't think they did. But that's my opinion. Um, then the question is, does it matter what the audience thinks? Man, is that a whole other thing. In fact, I'm going to do videos about that. Um, the answer is it matters what the audience thinks to the extent that you are trying to please them. <laughs> if you are writing something because you want to do what you want to do, then no, it doesn't matter at all what the audience thinks. If you are needing to please them because you need them to give you good reviews or pay more for tickets and stuff like that, then uh, yeah, it matters a lot what they think. And that's how come Hollywood spends a lot of time doing test screenings and often reshooting things in order to try and get that test screening number of things people liked up. Uh, that is pretty much routine at this point with any big studio movie. Um, so the answer is, does it matter what the audience thinks? It depends on what your goal is with the project um, and also how much control you have. If the producer who's paying for it cares what the audience thinks, then it doesn't matter what you think because you're not, you don't own it. The producer does. And there you go, they're the boss. Um, I'm gonna briefly take a, a quick moment here to, uh, and again, I apologize, I'm gonna figure out how to fix my, uh, Madeline says, Game of Thrones, for example, and she is talking about endings which just didn't fulfill the work before it. And yes, <laughs> in my opinion, the ending of Gaming, Game of Thrones was frustrating, although I don't hate it as much as so many others do. I was a little pissed off. Uh, yes, 
it's very possible. I mean, in my opinion, uh, the showrunners, once they in the last season or two, kind of, they, they tried to do too much too fast, is my opinion. Um, I kind of think some of the things in the ending were cool. I kind of think where Daenerys went, although painful, was okay. Uh, but I, I don't want to. I don't want this to become a, a little fan bot cluster here. This is about screenwriting, so let's let's not go too far about that. Except to say, Madeline, yeah, Game of Thrones. <sighs> Did they totally blow it? No. Should you not watch it because of the ending? No. It's good. It's a really, really solid series with a lot of magnificent work in it, even in the last season. There's there's my call on that. Um, I'm going to go to another question, which is, uh, I'm bad at grammar and spelling. Do you think I would not be able to be a good story because of that? Um, do you need to do grammar and spelling? Well, to a certain extent, technology can save your butt. Uh, the answer is spell check. Seriously. Um, the second uh, is you are going to have to add steps to your process. You are going to have to have people check it for you. I've actually worked with several writers who are not, uh, English is not their first language, um, and they're good writers, but English is not their first language, and they just make English clumsy mistakes. All they need to do is add some steps in their process where they show it to people and, and, and say to them, can you mark where the English is not is gone off the rails? You will have to, have to, it probably would behoove you to add that step. Have people who will just agree to read it for grammar and spelling and help you out. Um, that is it. I would suggest read a lot. Try to read as much as you can. You will absorb better grammar and spelling naturally. The more you read, the more you you internalize the language and you'll get better from reading. Plus, the more you read, the more you can steal, the more tricks you know, the more ways you find to express it. So reading, it seems like screenwriting is anti-reading. It's not. You are writing words when you write a script. You would be good to like that, <laughs> to, to be into the words uh, because they are your material that you work with. Um, Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the questions now um, because you guys are doing so cool. You are are asking uh, lots of cool questions. Um, I'm gonna try and get to them. This is this is delightful. I am really happy. Uh, Bria Rose, Bria Rose says I'm gonna read this to you because I bet you can't read that on the screen because I have messed up my uh, my typefaces here. Let me see if I. Uh, we're going to pause a second while I try and fix my text color. Um, let's see if this helps. Yeah, 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 yeah. It doesn't. <laughs> I apologize. I will, I will do the text stuff another time. Bria's question. How do you come up with external conflict? I have characters and I have their internal goals. I have a hard, hard time creating a plot. Okay, this is interesting. Um, partly, it's important to remember that um, you don't want to divide stuff up too much to internal and external goals. The truth is, they're kind of together. Um, I would need to know more details, but if you have internal goals, what I would do is start to brainstorm, how can I find external things that relate to them. In other words, you don't want an external plot that's completely unrelated to the internal goals. The internal goals are really, for instance, if their internal goal is, I want love, then the question is, why can't they get it? Oh, this is so great. Here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you. <laughs> this helps. This list of six questions. Who is it about? What do they want? Why can't they get it? What do they do about that? Why doesn't that work? And how does it end? I have uh, made an entire video about this. It's called The Six Essential Questions. It's on the website. Um, but I would say, Bria, 
uh, the the main thing is that you want to start asking those questions. Like, and in fact, contact me, contact me through contact me. Hold on, here we go. Contact me. Uh, go to writingforscreens.com, click on contact me. It will open up a thing. You write into it. It will send me an email. Um, I want to hear more about this because it may be a good lesson for everyone and maybe we can work together to put that on and then you get free advice and consulting and I get free material to teach with. So contact me so I can find out more about this issue. Uh, Troy David, I just watched Canal. Uh, I just watched Canal on Shutter. Oh, look, I did it. I fixed it. <laughs> I did it. Oh, boy. Okay, I watched Canal on Shudder and the beginning was fantastic. However, midway through the film, it started to drag on and get boring. What's a good way to realize a stopping point in writing? Come up with your ending. Know your ending. If you know that, if you have to believe that your ending is the best part of your story, it's the most satisfying and revealing and, and, uh, and powerful. And then you work back from there. Um, when things drag on, um, sometimes it's just the execution. It's how it's done. Um, and so the answer to that is try not to be boring. Try not to have things repeat. Try not to have people debate. Try not to have scenes without dramatic action. Uh, I did a whole video on that. It's called dramatic action. If you've got dramatic action, you are probably not going to be too boring. If you have character arcs, if there is a progress for the characters, um, you are probably not going to drag. So I would say, look into those questions. Um, the answer is, if you're telling a good story with strong characters who have strong needs, if you are working from these ideas, um, not to say it's an absolute rule, but it's helpful tool. That's what I'm trying to give you here is tools to apply to what you want to do, not to fit a formula that I think is good. Um, okay, last question. How do you choose which story to write next? This is good. This is, I actually was planning to do a whole video on this. Um, how do you choose which story to write next? Does the studio producer play a part in the back of your mind? Would you select a more... Um, sorry, got a, another question. Would you uh, select a more commercial vibe ah, over one that's close to your heart? This is tricky. Um, we're going to run a little long here. Um, how do you choose what to write next? Partly, it's a balancing act. You can't just choose from one reason. Um, if you just go with, and, and I mean, really, the answer is you go with how you feel. Um, but your feelings are complicated, so it's not going to be that easy. But the answer is you're the one who has to live with what you do. So look at what you're doing and say, if I write this and it fails, if it either sucks or if I think it's great, but everybody hates it, I'll still be glad I did it. That should be your main operating principle, because a lot of the time, even when you're a professional, I have been working as a professional for 25 years. I have literally dozens of jobs that I've worked on. But I've also written 10 or 15 spec scripts that never went anywhere. I mean, they got me meetings for new jobs, but they didn't sell. You have to be sure that you're going to like them, that you're going to say, I am glad I did this. So that's number one. Does a studio producer play a part in the back of your mind? Yes. Um, not in the studio, a studio producer, but the studio producer, the people who have the money to pay to make something. If you are going to do something that you believe they'll hate, you should have an alternate plan. I have done several projects where I said, I am not even going to worry about them because I'm going to find the money elsewhere. Because remember, it takes money or a lot of time and friends and, and, and self-education to make something yourself. It's worth doing if you're into that. It is worth finding people to do it if you are not into it. But the answer is, if you are going to say, 
I don't care what the studios think or I don't care what the business thinks. In fact, I believe I should go opposite to what the business thinks because there's an audience for those things. That's great. But plan on finding an alternate way to make it and distribute it. That's what I did. I did it with a movie called Disfigured, um, which I'm really proud of, like like uh, top of my life's pride is that I made this movie. I had to pay for it myself. Um, I found a distributor once it was done, but it was it was my vision and I was really proud of it. So the answer is, yeah, you can say, screw the system. I'll do what I want, but learn how to do that. Um, would you select a more commercially viable idea over one that's closer to your heart? Sometimes. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, remember, it's not writing, screenwriting is not a one time deal. You are going to be writing a lot of scripts. If you do this right, you will be writing dozens, dozens and dozens. And so, therefore, pick and choose. Say, this one for them, this one for me. Uh, John Sayles famously did that, uh, 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 independent guy, that uh, writer director that I very much admire. Um, say, for this one, I am choosing this set of goals. This one is to be commercially viable. This next one is closer to my heart. And honest to God, often the one that's closer to your heart but not commercially viable can get you commercial possibilities because following your heart is usually a good plan. Um, I had a friend who followed his heart. He wrote a television pilot set in a very grim real world, a realistic world about uh, juvenile prisons. It was um, an astonishingly good script. It was it, in, it, it dealt in all sorts of harsh realities, but beautifully. It was great. Um, and it was impossible. No one was going to make this thing. But then, uh, first of all, everyone will say, you are such a good writer. I can't make this, but boy, do I want to work with you. So that's that's key. Do that. Um, but the other thing that happened was The Night Of, a, an HBO uh, limited series um, written by Richard Price, directed by Steve Zalian, just a phenomenal piece of work um, dealing with uh, what it's like to be arrested and put in the justice system came, blew everyone away. All of a sudden, this thing that was impossible that my friend had written um, was possible because people were like, hey, these guys did it. They're Academy Award winners and, and had the, the pull to try something so risky, but they proved the audience would watch it. And then that project that was untouchable was interesting and as doing well, working its way through the, the system, uh, even as we speak. So I hope that was a good, uh, useful answer to Bodan. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, if you have further questions about this, contact me um, through contact me. Contact me. That's a way to contact. I'm sorry, that was too quick. Contact me. Um, okay, cool. And my last, seriously, this is the last question today. Should one read, dissect a screenplay so as to learn the tools and techniques? The, yes. Should you, should you break down scripts that you think are good? I did. Uh, I love this. I don't have to answer this one much because I have, hold on a second. I did a video about this. I strongly recommend doing this. Watch this video. It's called Take Art Apart. It's on the channel. It's a, a full discussion of how and why you should read and dissect screenplays, but also you should take movies that you love or shows that you love and break them down. Don't just read the script. Yes, read the script if you can, because it's fascinating to see how it, the writing transformed into the thing. But um, I strongly recommend that you take something you love, a finished work, a show, and take an episode of it and Make an outline. Hit pause after every scene and make an outline. Uh, use the outline format that I have suggested in How to Outline <laughs> um, or your own, whatever it is that you can use. But but break it down. See, what? how did they do this? 
um, because one of the most important things that you can learn is there are many, many ways to do it. Uh, there is no single formula. There is no single format. There's no rule. The scenes should be this long or they should have this many scenes or this thing should happen at this point. Those rules are just theories. They are one way to do it. They're not bad. You should know as many theories as you can because they're tools to know that you could do something that's like Singing in the Rain or you could do something like Wings of Desire, both of which are magnificent motion pictures, but it, you would be hard pressed to figure out a rule that applies to both of them. Uh, Singing in the Rain, by the way, and Wings of Desire, both highly recommended. It's hard to know how anyone will respond to either one because they're both in their own little worlds, but they're both really good. Um, all right. We have gone long. I must stop. I really appreciate this, uh, your questions and your hanging out with me, but it's time to go so that the people who are watching the video will not say, I can't watch something that long. All right. Take care. I will see you tomorrow.